As a creator, how well do you tend to deal with the stress of all the work it involves? Me personally, I've historically not been so good, and it's an incredibly common problem for everyone whether they're working in creative fields or not. And chances are Icelandic composer Johan Johansson probably wouldn't have been an exception, especially considering his success and reputation. Whilst we probably won't ever know what was going on in his mind in the run-up to his untimely death this year, recently released toxicology reports have got me thinking. Is there a link between creative people and mental health? You're watching Ranger on screen, and this is the life of Johan Johansson. Johan Johansson was born in Reykjavik on the 19th of September 1969. He was musically involved at quite a young age, learning piano and trombone at 11, like the best of people. However, he gave up his formal musical training in high school and studied literature and languages at university. For the next 10 years, he was writing and performing for indie rock bands, and he also started developing an interest in electroacoustic influences, mostly through electronic processing of acoustic instruments. His first solo album, Engleborn, in 2002, featured incredibly diverse influences such as Bernard Herrmann, Purcell, Sati, Moondog, and electronic labels such as Mego. His second album, Verge of Legu Forzatar, in 2004, featured brass ensemble plus electronic drones and percussion. And in 2006, his fourth album, IBM 1401, A User's Manual, featured sounds from the famous computer that his father used to engineer. It's a glorious blending of truly electronic and computerised sounds with orchestral. My personal favourite from the album, Processing Unit, is just gut-wrenchingly beautiful. Album number 6, Fordlandia, in 2008, was inspired by the failed Ford rubber plant in Brazil. And in 2010, he collaborated with filmmaker Bill Morrison on the Miners hymns. Film and accompanying composition featuring brass band, pipe organ and electronics, telling the story of miners' strikes in the 80s in County Durham, and the economic and cultural significance of this chapter of British history. It's certainly clear then that he took a lot of influence from home and away. Fiona Maddox of The Observer said, The strange counterpoint between an Icelandic minimalist, an American filmmaker, and a bitter episode in recent British history has resulted in a work as unclassifiable as it is unforgettable. And throughout the noughties he worked on a number of films and series such as Dis, Svartir Engla, and In the Arms of My Enemy. But probably his most famous work came when he collaborated with Dennis Villeneuve. Prisoners, Sicario, which won him an Academy nomination, Arrival and Blade Runner 2049 have all won critical acclaim. And for Blade Runner 2049, he worked with Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Wolfish so he could get exactly the right tone for the movie. And some of his final works were The Theory of Everything, Mary Magdalene, The Mercy, and Mandy, which is just being released now. But on the 9th of February 2018, he was found dead in his room in Berlin. Recently released toxicology reports reveal it was an accidental overdose of cocaine mixed with medication. And I'm not sure anyone he doesn't know him personally will ever know why why he decided to take that cocaine or what led to him being in that position that night, but it's entirely plausible that mental health and stress had something to do with it. Drug use in many artistic people has been noted for decades, maybe even centuries, with users such as the Beatles and maybe even Edgar Allan Poe. But despite this clinically recognised connection, the exact relationship between the two is not very well understood at all. Does it come about as a result of greater mental health issues, or does its effect on creativity lend itself to misuse by artistic people? We can't be sure about the exact nature of the relationship now, but if it's the former, more needs to be done to recognise the danger of drug abuse in artistic people and to offer the right treatment, and particularly the dangers for men as well. Not necessarily because more men abuse drugs and alcohol, but because of their role in toxic masculinity and the pressure put on men to prove their manliness. In the end, I don't really know if this applies much to Johan, but I do know that his inspiring, innovative and heartfelt sound cannot be drowned out by problems that may have been occurring underneath. He's already gone down in history as one of the innovators of blending orchestral and electronic music, and one of the greatest Icelandic musicians of all time. So here's my question for you this week. Do you think there's a link between artistic people and mental health? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit like and share it with anyone else you think might enjoy it. And if you're new here, it would be incredible to have you subscribe so you can join us in our mission of highlighting the importance of music and film to the world.